friend, do you make the sunset? Do you make the bright stars flee? Old crow, time is getting late. I know you can gift for me. Old bird, I see it in your talons, glittering between the leaves. And I'm swimming in the shallows You're calling from the deep And we bite our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like stone And we crawl through mud Till we reach the sky And we bite our time That's the beautiful voice and instrumentations of Glenn Dunn covering a song called Crow by the English band Tongue. Glenn was my first significant teacher as a young adult at art school, a passionate, sensitive and tenacious teacher that gave me, and many others since, true gifts in the form of well-crafted questions that pushed us beyond our comfort zones and helped us to get to know ourselves better so that we had something to make that could contribute back into the culture. Glenn taught with grace and care, and he continues to bear gifts, such as this song, which speaks of the crow, the raven of which is trickster, creator spirit on this land in Jeremother country. This series of podcasts is dedicated to Glenn's spirit of asking young people timely questions, specifically the volunteers who come to our School of Applied Neo-Peasantry to learn skills and knowledges, and to share their stories and labours in exchange for learning. This week's guest is Meg Ullman, co-founder of the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry and Artistus Family co-originator. Good morning, Meg. Good morning. On your birthday morning. I thought this might be a good time to do a podcast um, for reflection for you to reflect on your life right now and so and to share those thoughts with um, our audience I'd like to start with a a simple question where's your happy place hmm I've already had so many happy places, <laughs> been in so many happy places today. I might just name them for you. Sure. Waking up in my loft with the window open, two windows open, and the whirly gig, whirly bird open, and I could hear the magpie singing a new song which goes a little something like this this season Mm. oh it's so beautiful (laughs) so good so waking up in my loft I love my sheets, I love the space that you built for me, thank you. I love the magpies, I, it, I just feel very held in that womb cocoon space. Mm. It's a coolish summer's day here, so it was nice that you we decided to light the fire, so thank you for lighting the fire. And my second happy place was I'm sitting by the fire with my journal, writing while the kettle boiled. And I'm always a day behind, so I was writing about yesterday. So it's a nice time for reflection and just choosing one aspect of the previous day to focus on. My third happy place was taking clothes off and going outside to the plunge pool with you, my beloved, Mm. and thank you for putting rose petals 
in the blind pool this morning. That was very special. So just to be in that cold water. We haven't plunged for a few days because it's been so hot. So just to have that cool morning plunge again is definitely a happy place. And then just to be barefoot in the nude outside is another happy place. And another happy place is being in the nude by the fire, doing our rotisserie, turning from side to side, drinking tea. And then realising that we've got quite a bit of time before Woody has his class and going up into your loft and making love. Thank mm. you for that happy place. Mm. And then coming down and walking to feed the chickens and going past our mustard greens that are full of seeds ready to be harvested so we can make mustard and just have mustard seeds especially for pickling. And... As I go past at this time of year, I'm a bit fixated on picking the cabbage moth caterpillars off. So no matter how many times a day I go past and pick them off, there's always more. There are always more. So to pick a few off and give them to, my, to our baby chicks is a happy place to see them gather round and to go and feed the chickens and the ducks and the chicks and their mum and to change their water over and just to catch up with them and their news is a happy place. That's probably enough happy places. <laughs> yeah, that's, and it's only 10 o'clock. <laughs> it is. Beautiful. Mm. Thanks for sharing. With your mother hat on, because you wear a lot of hats, but with your mother hat on, what do children need? To be cared for. They need to be cared for in lots of different ways. They need their physical needs met. They need to be warm or cool. They need to be well fed. They need to be provided a place for them to sleep deeply and restfully and restoratively and then each each child is individual I would like to speak to what I feel Woody needs mm. and Woody needs some structure in his day some routine even if it's a very loose one this is what we're going to do now we're going to have a couple of hours to ourselves or to our collective projects and then we're going to do this in the afternoon I feel like he needs to know the kind of structure of the day um, he needs attention he needs to be he's a high needs kid in a low needs way you know he's he's hungry for engagement with the world and that engagement is a high need of his to really be present and to be focused. He's sort of the way he shows up in the world um, is a very... Um, he's punctual when he shows up with the world and he likes to have that punctuality met and he, he likes to be busy. He likes to make things, he likes to take things apart, he likes to engage. It's really exciting to see his language developing his written words his spoken words his way he's sort of making puns and jokes at the moment with words um yeah he needs to be engaged with and not not always by by people but by the the world around him mm. he needs I feel like he needs freedom to just be, to, you know, in the 70s they called it being bored, you know, <laughs> and they just needs time just to be, just to drift, not to have a deadline, not to have any anything on the to-do list, just to have time. Mm. And he needs autonomy to decide for himself 
what he's going to do with his own time and to decide what he would like to engage with and who he would like to engage with. Mm. One of the big roles that I see you fulfill for him is nutrition. Um, do you want to speak a little about that? So nutrition has over the last nearly two decades been a great passion of mine looking at what is available locally particularly plants plant medicine food medicine food as medicine and him to grow up to be strong resilient capable well adjusted and he is all of those things and on the way to being all of those things as a ten and a half year old and I feel like the nutrition that he gets in his food but the nutrition that he gets in the way of conversation in the way of the context that we provide him to exist within is all densely nutritious mm. you know he's, he's wanting to engage with the world and to find what he loves and what he's what's going to make his gifts shine and that's juicy meaty nutritious stuff and it's a joy to to witness him in his search and in his creation for a good juicy nutritious life mm, beautiful there are many forms of feminism what are what are the forms or the form that sings to you grounded earthy post deadline feminism In the past, I've also called it radical homemaker feminism, Sue Dennett feminism, permaculture feminism, free feminism, as opposed to empire feminism, corporate feminism. We need more CEOs. We need more um, women in parliament feminism. And I understand that there are many different kinds of feminists, I was going to say women, but I am, you know, obviously anybody can be a feminist. So there are many different kinds of feminists and therefore there are many different kinds of feminisms. And my definition of feminism has vastly changed over the years. And when I was a younger person, I thought feminism meant financial autonomy and to be in the workplace contributing in that way, in a financial way, and it, it meant not staying at home and it meant not being solely responsible for the housework and the cooking and the child rearing because that was the role that had been put on to women. And the last couple of tours that we've had, house and garden tours, we've had various permaculture groups come through and I've started the tour of the inside of the home after you have guided people and given them a tour of the outside of the home and the garden and the commons. And I have started the inside tour with an apology to my grandmother and I've said I would like to welcome you in with an apology to my grandmother Lucy because when I was younger I looked down upon her because she was quote unquote a housewife and she was ducks of her school when she matriculated and I saw that she had so much promise and that she could have done whatever she wanted but after she was married she decided to stay home, raise her family prepare the food, 
be responsible for her suburban homestead. Although they didn't grow food, it was a place of creating, making, deep relating and nourishment for the people in in her home. And I've always said that it was my grandfather who went out into the world and who met people and invited them back and it was my grandmother who stood at the door and welcomed them in. And I looked down upon I looked down on her and it wasn't until after she had died, and in fact we buried her on this very day, on my birthday, um, in 2009. Um, and it wasn't until a few years after she died that I realised what I, how I had disrespected her. I never said anything to her, but I did look down on her as a mere housewife. And what shifted for me was seeing the relevance and seeing the power in that. And I don't mean power over, I mean power with, power into. And I, I look at her now and the influence that she had on me and I'm so grateful for her, her role modelling of what you know she made everything from scratch and she didn't grow food but she bought it straight from the greengrocer who delivered a box every week so it was relational with him and she had the, the meat the butcher come over or the delivery guy and the fish monger come you know all of these people who came to her door and she interacted with and talked and talked about the produce and held it and beheld it and I I see myself doing that in, in, in my own way in my own version of what she did but I definitely am so grateful for her modelling In the current political model capital P politics if parliament was 90% women but we still had lobbying and revolving doors and industry capture or political capture by industry would anything be different? Yes I think things would be different but then again depending on depends on who the women are who were in in power because when I imagine what that might look like I think is it just going to be toxic matriarchy like we have toxic patriarchy or is it going to be women who are in touch with themselves as feminine creative beings and recently I was talking with a friend about when we were going to um, have this public gathering together that she and I and another woman are organising and she said it can't be on this particular date because that's when she bleeds and she has learnt over the years not to organise public events on you know when it's that time of the month so I think you know we would started talking about imagine if that was a, a worldwide phenomenon where women knew when they were ovulating, knew when they were bleeding, and not just because an app was telling them, but because they knew in an embodied sense. And that they they had days off. They had the red tent days where they were bleeding. I mean, mm. in my version of <laughs> the reality that you've just painted, that's what happens. And there's much more um, celebration of the mother and the family and maternal feminism. I understand um, where you went with that, like in ter terms of the more um, the differences uh, in between the sexes on uh, in a lived and biological way. But politically, would anything change? I mean, with mm. neoliberalism at the helm, it has to ruptured communities it has to be disconnected people 
and uninitiated people. And if you have them running the show, then you just get more of what we've got now. Yeah, which is power over. I mean, it would be hard to imagine that a quorum, you know, like a majority of women in parliament across the world would stand for. Mm. (laughs) Um, But I guess I'm asking a quite abstract question because I feel that the world that you and I are trying to uh, lean into and many other people are um, is fundamentally... Um, one where the mother is the this is the sacred pinnacle of the culture. That the feminine, giving, fruiting, regenerating, dying, bleeding, um, power or presence that that makes life possible. Um, is, you know, replaces this death urge of a collapsed and fallen power over patriarchy. I guess my my next question really leads on from that is what are some of your hopes? What do you, as a mother of a son as a community participant and a, a mother of many other children when they need it and they're ar- and you're around them um, what are your hopes what are your hopes for the next generations my hopes are that all the schools stop running <laughs> and that all the kids <laughs> are let loose and free and that all the parents decide to stay home (laughs) and grow food and nurture the next generation of all beings of the trees and the birds and the bees and the dogs and the children and that they make those informed choices because they realise what it means to be part of the incarceration of the debt economy and they realise the trap of comfort and comfortability and how incarcerating and disconnecting that is. Some some would say that's that's like a, a hippie utopia that you're describing. Well, you asked for my hopes. <laughs> um, but I, I know you... You didn't say practical hopes. <laughs> I know you um, very well, and I know that there's more detail in that. There's more nuts and bolts. There's more lived experience in that like I mean just your first point about children being free and outside of school we know what that looks like Um, but many families couldn't imagine what that looked like looks like many people experienced what it was like to have all family members in the home locked up throughout COVID But what does it look like when there isn't lockdown, when the whole family is at home and the neighbourhood is engaging and the kids in the neighbourhood are outside on the street playing or down by the creek bringing Yabby's home for the dinner bowl? They're the sorts of relationships that we've experienced as either children or parents and or both. I think when a lot of parents imagine the struggles and the hardship of them of taking their children out of school and them becoming their children's primary teachers I think people imagine it in isolation because if they were to make that decision 
in the current context, then it, it might be one child over here taken out of school and another child over here. But if we imagine it collectively, I guess it's very similar to school holidays. There's that, and there's also looking back even further at more traditional land-based cultures where the, the children are always looking up at the, the next age bracket of kids just above them. What are they doing? What are they learning? What, what can they do? And then the older kids looking at the adults. And so everybody's, you know, that see it, you've got to see it to be it. They're looking at the kids just older, more capable than them, more knowledgeable than them. Mm. And to see, to learn by doing what the culture values. Yeah, there's this, uh, what you've described just then is social integration across generations. That, that's the traditional village. And what we have in an industrial sense is social engineering, which is a, a sort of a separation out. So you only identify really with your class, maybe one class above and maybe one class below if you're in a, in a sort of a romantic sense as you get older at school. But ultimately it's your class year level. And you see the, uh, the pullovers that say class of 88 mm -hmm. or class of 2020. It's real identifying in this socially engineered... And I, I, <clears throat> I guess also it's, it's all top down because the children don't get to choose for themselves who their mentors and teachers are. They're just given a teacher. They don't get to decide what they want to learn. They just get given the curriculum and the goalpost that they have to learn this by a certain mm. age or a certain time of the year. And, you know, schools have their place. I know a lot of really wonderful teachers who are very gifted. Those teachers, though, unfortunately, very little time to actually teach these days. It's more like how to... It's in the forced learning model... It's more like um, at this age group, the, a core group of, you know, the, the majority of children should be at this level. Mm. And that's just a very bizarre way of learning. I mean, as mammals, we learn through play and experience and through story and um, by ecological knowledges, by interacting with where our food comes from. For most of human history, we've being great generalists with with tools, with foraging, with hunting, with gardening. And this is the human experience. So around food, culture, story, mythology um, is, is supported by uh, and is determined by the land in which uh, our economies depend. So with the this hyper abstraction uh, from a relationship with land we have this bizarre form of educating our children this very sort of um, and Charles Eisenstein would call this the part of the culture of separation and so the culture of separation in an industrial schooling sense has been you we were educated in that but there did seem to be like the compliance factory aspect of schools today didn't seem to be to the same level of extreme that it is today and what we're seeing is ideological um, shaping of children about what's correct and what's incorrect what what you can think and what you can't think what you can express and what you can't express. Um, so while, you know, our industrial schooling has given us gifts, which I can't disregard, I can't pretend they're not there, it also gave a lot of pain, reoccurring nightmares as a young person, feeling controlled and trapped. I remember those feelings very strongly.
But in terms of the next generation and how they are responding to the challenges that are coming at us all, what are some of the key things we can do to help our children build resilience, build connection, and um, lean in to other possible stories of culture? What are some of those key... I know that's a really big question, but mm. what are some of the nuts and bolts? Mm. I mean, two things come to mind. The first one is... And, you know, there are some local schools who are trying to do this and they have kitchen garden programs. And we have a neighbour, a neighbour Andrew, who used to be the gardener at the local primary school and then he would help the kids garden and grow the produce and then take them into the kitchen and then they would cook up that food and share it together. And just to go through that whole process, that is so beautiful. And there are kids who, you know, that's been the highlight of their schooling experience still today when, you know, there are some kids who you ask them what they love about school and that's what they say. I think that is a really fantastic program. Um, and if they, they're not getting that education at home or in their community from various community gardens, um, then how wonderful for them to have that connection. Um, and the second thing is resilience is, in my opinion, is built by experience. Usually what we in our culture classify as negative or challenging experiences. So when you are constantly falling over, you learn how to navigate paths and obstacles so you don't fall over. It's that same kind of it's that same kind of thing. So when you have challenges in your life, you are affected by them. You don't, but if you avoid them, then you don't learn and you don't grow. So I think to try to stop kids from climbing trees, just as a practical nuts and bolts example, if you don't let them have knives or sharp objects, if you put um, or only safe playground equipment for them to play kids to play on in the school so they can't fall down if you say you're not allowed to climb trees if you take away danger and risk then how can you learn how can you learn danger and risk mm. and you know our our culture is so obsessed with safety and for adults too that there's there's no resilience everybody's triggered by something so they want to move away from the pain instead of thinking wow that actually hurts what, what what's what's it provoking what's the what's the lesson in there for me what's the deep soul searching that i need to do and if you're not taught resilience and bounce back ability and how to engage with suffering as a kid you're lost as an adult mm. Yeah, we're recipients of two very good kitchen knives, second-hand kitchen knives that were given to us by a home economics teacher because the school was getting rid of these beautiful sharp knives that we do a lot of butchering and cutting of vegetables with. And it's just every step that's lost from the industrial schooling system like that, those little stories that just keep getting lost. First mm. it was cut down the trees uh, to stop the kids from climbing them. Then it was make sure boys don't rumble and play fight. And, you know, it's just endless. And now the kitchen knives have gone from the school because someone could get hurt. And now the grass is gone, so they just have yeah. this pretend grass. Yeah, the highly toxic leaching, chemical leaching astroturf. That, and boiling in summer, yeah. in Australian summers. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously we're staying in the negative <laughs> uh, negative space around sc school because, you know, we feel very passionate that this is, school is such a, well, it could be such a place of potential, mm. community-based schools. It could be just so different, but yeah. it's, of course, their systems, like so many neoliberal institution systems of control, rather than of... Um, of creating the sense of abundance in learning and life learning 
and life skills. Um, so, yeah, just I want to go from children to men as a woman in this community. What do you need from men? I need to be seen by men. I need to be not picked up when I'm hugged by men. There are a couple of men who have in the past years, because I'm small, gone to hug me, they lift me up and I've had to ask them and you have on one occasion too, Patrick, had to ask them to put me down and yep, so I need not to be picked up by men <laughs> in a childlike way. Um, I need to be acknowledged. I think it's the same as the women. I, I need. I would like to be seen and valued and acknowledged for who I am and for what I have to offer this community. Mm. I mean, my that's general men. You as a man are very specific what I need from you mm. as a man. What do you need from me? Well, I need all of those things to be seen and to be respected. Can I pick you up occasionally? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you will... <clears throat> I mean, you're physically stronger than me. Mm. So while you're still able, and then I feel like that baton is going to be passed on to Woody, but if you can keep bringing, filling our basket with firewood mm -hmm. and keep filling my baskets with turnips and many other vegetables and fruit to preserve you as the head gardener. But, you know, that's not specific to you as a man, either of those things. They're just specific to you as a person, but you are a man, so they're, therefore they're specific to you. Um, I would like you to keep... Um, bringing, helping to bring forth my orgasms. <laughs> sure. Happy to do that. <laughs> and to keep being the wonderful, <clears throat> flawed human being who you are. Mm -hmm. For me to be wonderful and flawed and constantly learning beside and for you to keep being Woody's dad and Zephyr's dad and community father and mm. I feel so privileged that I get to share my life with you yeah to be able to grow with you like we are continuing to grow and to grow into you know as we grow as Woody grows to grow into the the parents of another teenager and yeah to keep you said to me the other day that you really like how I show up in the world well you know I can show up in the world like this because of how you show up in the world like this and you can show up because of how I show up so just to be each other's companions so we can keep growing and adjusting and being continue to be open to being challenged together mm. is very important for me. Mm. Beautiful. What do you see in elders that you are leaning towards in your own life right now? The monthly women's circle that I am part of, for crying out loud, we recently had an, a sacred circle for Sue, Sue Dennett, who turned 76, and we had a shared meal at the fire circle in the forest together, and then we had various circles where we honoured Sue and honoured our relationships to her and also our relationships to ourselves and to what she provokes in each of us and what elements of her that we want to cultivate in ourselves and what I what I honoured one piece one part of Sue that I mean I just 
love her so dearly and I'm so grateful to have her in my life mm. as an elder and an, a living elder, like a living ancestor who I get to be friends with and mm. ask, ask questions of her in real life. Just feels like I'm, yeah, I'm very grateful to be alive at the same time as her. And so one of the things that I honour about her is her wild wisdom. She's a wild woman. She's mm. she's a barefoot, says it like it is, all cards on the table, bright north star, shining woman. But it's her wildness. It's her wild white hair. It's her crazy cackling laugh. It's her simple, incredible meals that she puts together for 20 people at the drop of a hat. It's her, it's her simpleness. It's her radicalism. It's her, her heckles that she'll just call out when we go to different <laughs> talks. <clears throat> it's her it's her ability to grow and and be humbled by her own flaws and own mistakes and really wanting to grow from those mm. and I've really seen the growth as she ages yeah she's really looked at where she can improve in her interpersonal relationships and has really put a lot of effort into adapting and to growing and being more humble as well. Mm. And I definitely honour her for that and value the gift she brings to the world enormously. Another elder who I feel very privileged to have her in our, our lives um, is Sandeepa. And Sandeepa is much more reserved and quiet and she's a researcher. She's also a, a grounded, earthy woman who's, who's really concerned with the details of natural processes. And yeah, her re her ability to research, and it's like the research she does is just to back up her intuition, and all of our intuition. And mm. she's so humble and gracious and generous, and so incredibly generous to so many people in our community, especially young people. She's really a, a lifter up lift her up her <laughs> in the best kinds, not in an unwanted lifting up way. <laughs> um, lift, lift her up her of, of young people in this community and a supporter, a great supporter. And also to watch Sue and David in their relationship and how they navigate challenges and differences and growing and also Sandeepa with her partner Sambodhi, just to see them love each other and support each other and to still be in love after so many years and to see them holding hands and physically adoring each other mm. is very special. So I definitely honour Sandeepa. Mm. Um, and the third elder in my life who nourishes me no end is Nikki, Nikki Marshall. And Nikki brings also deep intuition it's her listening she's such a deep listener to the world around her and I'm very grateful that I can be in her orbit and that I'm listened to and you know I'll tell her an issue that I'm having or a challenge that I'm confronted with and she'll really take time and think about it and help me by asking just such beautifully pointed questions, help me work my way into that issue and then if I <laughs> am diligent <clears throat> with the work to work my way through it or 
really go into the into the belly of it and again just generous also earthy and grounded and just so generous in how she shows up so heart space and interested in everything when she comes over and it's asking Woody the most interesting questions and she just has it's like she has time in it eternal time to be present to those she's interested in which seems to be everybody mm. and you know for all three of those women Sue Sandeepa and Nikki especially as they age it's really I see them <clears throat> struggling with how much they have to give the world with how much they need to not give the world and just take time for themselves to deeply rest so as I am aging being 49 today I'm also seeing myself change in that way that I'm much more protective of our quiet of the privacy we have have in our home space and whereas we used to take volunteers whenever people could come to us now we take volunteers for a week a month even just to put those boundaries up um, mm. I feel like I've learnt that from how those three women are taking time just to recuperate and just to to tend to their own needs before they tend to everybody else's mm, that's that thing isn't it of um, being in right relation in all the in all the ways mm. before you can be of service yep. um, yeah there are three powerful women in my life as well I'm so glad you took time to describe give give our listeners uh, insight into some of those special elder women in our community and you don't really need to know them personally it's no. just more to know that I think in every community um, there are elders and sometimes they're completely unseen and I think one of the jobs or one of the community projects you and I have been really committed to over the last decade is to reinstate the status of elders or mm. to re-elevate mm. the status of elders. Mm. But also to mm. know that you don't automatically become an elder. You know, there's a difference between an older and an elder and you don't get to declare yourself an elder, that mm. that has to be seeked of you, yeah, sought or, of you. Yeah, or the community res refers to you as yeah, that. Yeah, or invites or, you to... Yeah to come forward and a definition I think I have of an elder is someone who has attended to um, their narcissism a thing that is um, yeah in plague proportions mm. in our culture mm. someone who has attended to their ego in order to be of service yeah. and also yeah to I guess that's the right relationship mm. So a final question. We started with what is your happy place? I want to hear what fear are you holding right now? What is, or fears, what are some of the fears or, the, or a fear that's sitting in your body right now? I think the first one that comes to mind is that that the totalitarian glimpses that we've seen of so many world governments over the last two years <clears throat> continues to strengthen and continues to get its foot in the door and interfere so much with people's lives that that interference will be invited in by people because they will see that as safe, a safe option to live in a greater um, nanny state, I guess, for want of a better word, and that we won't be able to live our lives 
as we would like that we won't be able to grow our food that we won't be able to carry pocket knives that we won't be able to walk and ride our bikes around freely that we won't be able to decide for ourselves what medicines and what foods we would like to put in our own bodies so that's sort of a big a big fear like a big picture fear it's not necessarily a, a big although it is a big fear in my life it is it's a big political fear and I've seen the compliance over the last few years of very dear friends and family and have been shocked by their compliance and their they're giving away the rights the bodily human rights like the basic the basic human rights of people like us and who are still think who still think that the decisions they've made have been the right ones at our expense and that we don't have a right to choose for ourselves and that they still believe that so that is a great fear um I, th I think I'll leave it at that. Mm. Yeah, they're big, big things in my life too right yeah. now. Yeah. And I think also <clears throat> that the friends and family who I felt have given us away and have turned to compliance over compassion, that those relationships won't be repaired, that those ruptures will stay in place. Mm. And that's very painful, particularly family members, but also community members who I love dearly and would like to be able to navigate these tricky times with because it's been tricky for everybody, not just for the, the vilified like us. You know, I, we are, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make out that we're victims but we have been turned into and called second-class citizens and at least sort of underclass. And how do, we, how do we navigate with compassion, with family and friends, these, our relationships with them when they're still holding us in that place? Mm. And, yeah, my fear is the big picture and the small picture of these relationships as a result of the bigger picture mm. staying in a place of yeah top down power over mm. yeah well we could leave it on that fearful note <laughs> but i think i feel called to ask you one more question Right now, in this room, yep. what are you alive to? Mm. I'm alive to riding my bike up to one of the community gardens to pick berries. Because mm. they're abundant at this time of year. And it's been so hot. I haven't wanted to be outside in the sun picking berries. But it's a cooler day today. So I'm keen to take a small bucket and fill my guts and my bucket with mm. berries. Beautiful. And may we as people always be able to pick berries mm. from community patches mm. with water that's not been poisoned, mm. with soil that hasn't been contaminated, and with an intention of extending human health. Mm. And with gratitude for the berries and for the planters of those berries and for the tenders of those berries and gratitude for the birds for leaving us some. Beautiful. Thanks, Meg. I really love this strange little public, intimate <laughs> <laughs> podcast. Mm.
Thanks for having me on. Old bird, you and I are brothers, bonded by earth and wood. Old crow, you and I are sisters, swimming in a bowl of blood. Old friend, you and I were strangers, living by a restless sea. That you were calling me And we bought our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like stone And we cross through mud Till we reach the sky And we bide our time And we bide our time Shed our skins, and we shake our bones, and we sink like stone, and we crawl through mud till we reach the sky, and we bide our time, and we bide our time, and we shed our skins, and we shake our bones, and we sink like stone. And we crawl through mud till we reach the sky, and we bide our time.